The second presenter is Professor Sophie Lemire, who's in the back, Associate Professor of Basic Medical Sciences, who is conducting an international breast cancer and nutrition project to develop a comprehensive understanding of the influence of life environment and ancestry on dietary habits and the development of specific forms of breast cancer. This turns out to be an enigmatic problem that involves deciphering the risk mechanisms of a disease for which no external causative agent has yet been identified. So, good morning, everyone. You should also, are you going to introduce yourself? Yes, if you want to, but Elena Weinbaum is going to share the presentation with me. And uh, she's a department head of anthropology, and you will understand that we have a dear need for uh, a better understanding of cultures for our work. So she's a, really a key um, person in this effort. So um, I'm going to speak to you about a project that we started thinking about at the end of 2008 and um, that has involved a lot of people at Purdue University and I'm pleased that we have the possibility of presenting our progress today. I'm going to focus on the work that pertains to the GPRI uh, project. You all understand it's a huge project that we have uh, uh, overall. And so uh, beside Ellen Grenbaum, we also have, a, for that project, a partnership with Laurence Gabriel, who is a French uh, expert in health law and now getting a PhD in health law um, since our project. And she's in the audience today because she comes twice a year at Purdue, and it happened that finally she could come this week, so you'll be able to ask her a question um, also. So the problem that I'm going to speak about is quite different from what you have heard, because here we focus on primary prevention of breast cancer, and there's no solutions to speak of at the moment. And as you see, these two maps here, they look very similar, and they are separated by six or seven years. And it shows the incidence of breast cancer in the world with, in red, the highest incidence, and then pink and orange. They change their colors between the two maps so that we can not really compare. We're not supposed to do that. And what happened is that already in 2003, the World Health Organization called the scientists and health care uh, professionals and anybody interested in industry and some governments to come together and do something to stop the incidence from rising and switch the priorities from detection and treatment to prevention, meaning primary prevention, which is looking at people who do not have the disease, do not even know if they are at risk, and then for those that finally you could uh, identify as being at risk, then do something to prevent the cancer from uh, developing. And this is what we know about primary prevention of breast cancer at the moment. We know about potential risk factors. I put the list here, and all these risk factors are somehow related to lifestyle. You may not think that early menarche or late menopause are related to lifestyle. They, they are because they are actually linked to nutrition and in the, uh, the way do our, we are feeding ourselves or that our parents felt ourselves, themselves can influence uh, early menarche or late menopause in the uh, offspring. So there's a huge involvement of lifestyle on the risk for breast cancer and what do we propose at the moment for women who would be classified at high risk and that's based mainly on uh, mutations, for instance, in some genes that we know increase their risk by 90% to develop breast cancer. This is what's proposed, double radical mastectomy, sometime ovariectomy, estrogen modulator, tamoxifen, which is extremely dangerous as a drug, uh, can lead to death uh, from blood clot or can lead to another type of cancer, and then also follow up. Not acceptable, obviously. You cannot just put a whole population of women who might be at risk through this. And unfortunately, some women, this is the only solution they have if they come from families at high risk. But this is not primary prevention to speak of. So obviously, we are 40 or 50 years behind when it comes to primary prevention for breast cancer, but also a number of other uh, cancers uh, for which we don't know a cause. We know the cause for lung cancer. 99% of lung cancers could be uh, stopped if people stop smoking. We don't have 
uh, that luxury of having one cause for breast cancer. So we started this international breast cancer and nutrition program because nutrition seems to be quite influential uh, regarding breast cancer, but we don't have definite evidence. We are extending it to more of the life uh, style um, factors now, and this is the vision that we just worked on a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago with the core committee, uh, ABCN committee at Purdue, and you see it's a big vision, and I'll, I'll explain why. So this is, uh, the, our vision is to uh, have a model for primary prevention of non-communicable diseases that will advance science, inform health communication, provide strategies, and improve public policy on breast cancer prevention. This ABCN will force global collaborations on research that takes culture, environment, including nutrition and lifestyle into account, and the research-based initiative will transcend political, social, and economic factors. So there's a big vision, and really the idea is that we want this to be a model for other chronic diseases on how to approach a problem that's worldwide. Um, why public policy is important? Well, First of all, this is an international public health concern. Uh, when we speak about breast cancer, there have been a number of recommendations that have been made by international uh, groups, uh, including WHO, IARC, International Agency for Research on Cancer. And this then is, these recommendations are implemented then by the different countries. So there's an important aspect in public policy there. What is very important to understand is that when it comes to primary prevention, there's, whole, there's a whole world to uh, discover in terms of public policy, uh, I guess, from, I'm not a pub policist, obviously, I'm a biologist, but um, you are going to deal now with people who are not sick. Um, you are going to have to work with them, even get samples from them. Uh, it's, it's a whole new era when it comes to dealing with these type of patients. Um, you cannot, you know, there are things that are done with people who have uh, advanced cancers that will never be possible. You cannot even think of proposing them, of course, to people who are not sick with invasive procedures and so on. The type of drugs that would have to be developed in prevention has to be absolutely uh, different from what is proposed now to treat cancer because you cannot have drugs that are so harmful that it could people put people at risk. So there's, there's a lot of uh, things to be done. And also there is obviously a mind shift that we have to uh, influence in terms of primary prevention because scientists and clinicians, they don't think in terms of primary prevention. They think in terms of curing or treatment, but not about preventing yet, and so it's the same with the population. They actually don't know what primary prevention is about or policy makers. So we really want to uh, have an influence on uh, the understanding of what primary prevention is and what it entails. <clears throat> and so as part of this big effort, we have uh, the will to bring together a community of scientists and uh, people interested in health in general to build this, this community on primary prevention research. And we also have a common goal of a project which is kind of unique because it has to be done worldwide so that we achieve the necess necessary diversity in the in incidence, food patterns, and, and uh, also culture. Because cancer, for those of you who are not biologists, is linked to change in expression of the genes. So we have our genes that are normally expressed a certain way, some are silenced, and in cancer you have a number of genes that are now going to be expressed when they were silenced and vice versa. And what controls the expression of genes is called epigenetics. This is basically the way that the genes are wrapped inside our cells, and if it's very tightly wrapped, they cannot be expressed. If it's loose, they can be expressed. And there's more and more evidence that the control of gene expression comes from the environment, greatly from the environment, including nutrition. I've, studied, uh, I've worked on, on gene expression control for a long time um, and uh, was not thinking of the environment because I'm a, working in cells and the laboratory, but when I started looking to the literature, this is incredible what can influence our epigenome. You know, what you ate this morning for breakfast has probably already affected a number of your uh, genes. It's, it may be just temporary, 
and it will go away once the uh, nutrients has, has, been ingest, has been digested. And so many of them may last for a long time, and you can, might be able to transfer that change to your offspring. So, uh, you know, if you have a child in the next... Uh, few months. <laughs> so it's really, it's, it has a huge impact. So we thought that in a way, a way to really try to help primary prevention of breast cancer would be to understand the link between diet, because it seems to have a huge influence all over the world, the countries in which breast cancer is, is rising at the moment in terms of incidence. They also have a shift in their dietary pattern. Uh, that's the case for Africa, it's the case for the Middle East, and uh, also for Asia. And then also understand the link with the types of breast cancer. Because there's just not one type of breast cancer. There are many kinds of breast cancer. And one more study shows that the type of breast cancer that is developing is linked to what happens very early on in life, even uh, during childhood, even in utero. And... Uh, this, so we have to take that into account. This is a very multidisciplinary project that will look at technologies, ways to measure risks, to deliver possible preventive strategies that are non-invasive. So we have to reinvent those methods. And so we're working with engineers on this. Communication is a key aspect, of course. And <clears throat> then we also need uh, anthropologists, economists, because we have to show the public value of primary prevention, and ultimately we want to influence public policies from our results. Um, so there's a lot to be done. This is the way that this, this uh, project is organized at Purdue University, so you see they have a lot of different uh, disciplines involved, and it's under the Women's Global Health Institute that was just created at Purdue University. Um, and the Oncological Sciences Center with a strong partnership with the Global Policy Research Institute. And for the clinics, we work with uh, IU Cancer Center in Indianapolis. And then we thought that the best way to start this project was to make partnership with one country per region of the world. And we chose those countries very carefully um, looking at what was their interest in breast cancer, so notably screening, because that's secondary prevention. This is as early as uh, countries go now in terms of public policies, is to try to implement uh, widespread screening for breast cancer, which is very controversial if you have followed the, uh, what's happening in the uh, science and the press and media lately. Um, they have also an interest in nutrition research, cancer registries, which will facilitate the work, and different incidents and dietary patterns. And we started with six countries, United States, France, um, Lebanon, Ghana, Uruguay, and Japan. Now, we're going to tell you what we have done for this, uh, the, the GPR, GPRI part of the project. So it's a team of three women who have traveled the world. And uh, it was a lot of fun <laughs> with a very different, uh, we, are, we are international, two of us have a French accent, and we have culturally, all three of us have a different culture, a background, well, different profession and, and dis different disciplines. We also have an undergraduate student who is, has been working on a, specifically on a project with me and Ellen. So the goal of the GPRI project was to set the stage for international collaborations by understanding how legal and cultural aspects impact policy decisions in terms of breast health. Because the breast is just not any type of organ. It, has, it is more than just an organ. It, is, it has a sexual connotation. It has a fashionable connotation. It's, uh, it's, it's really, in, in some of the countries we have, have visited, having a disease in the breast is like almost being, that's, that's the end of your life uh, in the society or in families. Uh, so it's, you know, it has huge consequences in terms of how women then will approach anything that will be done to their breasts. Or if they have a disease, they will hide it so that they are not shunned uh, from society. And we had two aims. One, to engage with local anthropologists and public health experts. Um, why anthropology? Because of nutrition infrastructure, that's quite important uh, to understand women's body image, as I just told you, and the place of breast in the society. And then the other aim to further develop knowledge to implement IBCN research project in partner countries, because we want to have that global project to understand epigenetics and uh, the link between epigenetics and nutrition and the types of breast cancer. And this means we will have to 
to recruit that normal tissue from the breast. This is, has never been done except in Indianapolis. That's the first time in the world that this was attempted a couple of years ago to collect tissue from women who are not, dis- who are not sick of the disease. And this is something that's absolutely uh, unthinkable in some of the countries at the moment. And it's, you know, we have to think of how we can do this. But we need to have access to that tissue. One of the major problems in primary prevention is that a lot of scientists work with cancer cells and they think they are doing primary prevention by seeing what stops the cells from proliferating. That's not primary prevention. That's tertiary prevention, which is to develop uh, then ways to stop a cancer from proliferating. But the cancer is already there. So in order to prepare for this, we spent several months researching the countries uh, that could be uh, then our partners. Then we contacted people in those countries, uh, did a background research on what's the status on, of different aspects, breast cancer, uh, nutrition, research, and so on. And we prepared documents, each of us, on different aspects, the biology and, and medicine aspects, the uh, anthropology aspects, and the uh, health law and public policy aspect and each other's uh, mode may prepare those documents. And then they, each country established an itinerary for our visit that lasted one week. And then it was just a, uh, we had a blast, if I can say, because we were so welcome. So I'm going now to let Ellen tell us what we have learned in those different countries. All right, I'll try to use this microphone, and if you would advance the slides as appropriate. The first uh, country we'll be talking about is Uruguay, where we uh, were able to go and visit the beach and see wonderful avant-garde sculpture on the beach and eat a lot of food and have a really wonderful time getting to know the, the, know the country um, in just a few days. But this is a very quick as- attempt to assess initially some of our findings to help guide us in our future research and figure out what needs to go further. But the most important goal was to establish these partnerships with other molecular biologists and anthropologists or sociologists, economists, and so on, that might be able to lead the team in the country in the future. So I want to make sure about that you understand that that was our primary goal. Um, so our, our observations are kind of broad brush strokes on, on what's the, the, uh, the, the basics that we needed to get started with. Uruguay seemed very promising to us also because it had such a well-developed system of health care. It's very well organized. It's very... Um, uh, they have a cancer registry that we were able to visit. It was very careful in how they proceed, and they've given a lot of thought to how to have very, very accurate statistics. Part of this is because they have a very well-organized National Health Service kind of system, which has been able to actually place mammography in all the regional areas. They've given a lot of uh, emphasis on breast cancer and on cancer generally through this honorary commission on the fight against cancer, which we think is um, an interesting model. And and the people there were great leaders in doing cross-disciplinary and cross-institutional connections that would enable them to develop research and policy. So this was a a very, very um, important finding. And they have very clear ethics rules. We were also able to meet with the Minister of Health, who blessed our project and encouraged us a great deal. We were able to meet with uh, university leaders and other um, honorary health or honorary commission leaders. So we think that we'll have very good, strong support there. They formed a team while we were there and have been, are willing to partner with us in grant proposals and research projects in the future. Um, the sophisticated system for communication is of health information was also something of great interest to us because we want to make sure that once the research can go forward, we will also have the ability to have the cultural and um, communication knowledge that we need to be able to do anything with that knowledge. One of my contentions as a medical anthropologist has always been that it, it's not um, enough to have the science. It also We also have to understand how do you get humans to use the science? How do you develop structures that enable the diffusion of knowledge? So that's why we are very concerned to work with communication and social sciences in this as well. Um, I think you can go on to the next one. We did find uh, entrepreneurship going on there, but I wanted to mention a couple of the cultural factors that we focused on was one, the relative homogeneity, a single language for the country, 
country uh, widespread acceptance of biomedical services. And we think that might be a really excellent platform for being able to, first of all, get the communication about research that might encourage people to be willing to donate healthy breast tissue, which is she didn't explain, but it's a needle biopsy that would take a very small amount of tissue out of a healthy breast. So a woman, in order to be convinced to do that, has to really be on board with the idea of contributing to knowledge that will help women. And we think this is an excellent place to begin that sort of thing, just as it was in Indianapolis. Um, from the nutrition, we saw a lot of European influences, but a lot of meat is eaten. Meat is extremely popular in this part of South America, and a lot of it very charred meat. And there are researchers in Uruguay who are studying the effects of consumption of charred foods versus other sorts of cooking methods. And they also have this drink called yerba mate. Yerba mate, which is illustrated here, um, people are going around with these little bowls of this kind of tea-like stuff that they drink a lot. And some of the people there said, well, this can't be good for you. And others said, no, it helps protect you. So we feel like this is something that is very, very common in Uruguay. And so therefore, it ought to be part of, just as you look at other forms of nutrition, you might want to pay attention to that one as well. Um, we also talked a little bit about physical activity in each place. And it's hard to get an initial take on that. But we heard some refer to, oh yes, this is sitting Uruguay, because we all sit too much. Well, if that's the case, that's going to have a health impact. Let's go on to the next one. Um, now we went to Lebanon, that actually was our first trip, was to Lebanon, and our affiliation in Lebanon was the American University in Beirut. AUB is very well known for having the major, the leading hospital, the leading medical school, the leading um, cutting edge research is going on at AUB, and uh, the campus is extremely beautiful. It's right on the Mediterranean. We're going to be sending one of our undergraduates or a recent graduate there this summer so that she can work with the nutrition faculty. We met with public health faculty, and we found that AUB is really uh, going to be a great connection for us. They do have a national cancer registry. It's not well developed and thoroughly um, implemented for the whole country, but it's a very complex country. As you know, it had a long period of civil war, has many different ethnic groups, many different religions. It has a lot of refugees from the wars and conflicts in the region, particularly Palestinians, now Iraqis, and, and from various places. And it's, it's also a vacation spot for the entire Middle East. So major cosmetic surgery centers are in Beirut. So it's a really excellent place to do medical research. And anything related to prevention will be complicated by that complexity, but also made more significant because it will give us lessons that could be carried to a region. Um, they have a good system of tissue collection, and we were able to um, figure out that the ethics rules are not yet fully implemented, but they have good people in the leadership, and we got to meet with some of them. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, we focused a lot on the uh, foods because we were really interested in whether the Middle Eastern diet that we think of as lots of olive oil and hummus and all these good vegetable things and goat cheese and whatnot, to what extent was that found here? And right across the street from American University in Beirut is a McDonald's, and right next to McDonald's is a wonderful restaurant with all Middle Eastern food. So we saw that incredible transitions that may be occurring in diets. Also, uh, the, the, one of those photos is one we took in the student, um, the equivalent of PMU, but it's students eating pizza. And But they also have baklava and so on for diabetics. They're really health-oriented in their use of traditional pastries. So we were really interested in that. Um, Okay, let's go, on. let's go on to the next one. I think we'll run out of time. The, the, the third country that I wanted to speak about was Ghana, where our institutional base was Peace and Love Hospital. Now, you'll find that in each of these countries, we also found a primary institution with whom we will partner and work, and that will be our connection. Here, it's the Peace and Love Hospital, led by a woman who was here for our conference on campus in 2010, Dr. Beatrice Wiafi Adai, and she's uh, pictured in the center with with Sophie and me and, and her staff at her hospital in Kumasi, Ghana. She founded Breast Care International because she found breast care being neglected by the healthcare institution, and so she decided to make a private hospital and get moving on it. This healthcare infrastructure in the country is now assisted by the fact that they've implemented a national health insurance uh, plan, which will enable accredited hospitals like hers to be able to, um, to offer 
offer reimbursement for care or get reimbursement for care. But in addition to treatment, she decided after hearing about our prevention initiatives that she would like to partner with us on that. So although she's a surgeon and we saw advanced ulcerated cases of breast cancer, we know this is a major burden for Ghanaian women who have in the past not gotten treatment for their breast cancer. And it's been enabled to grow to very advanced stages where it requires treatment. But this kind of practice needs to be prevented. That's all the more reason why they want to prevent it. So the ideas about the breast, the strong values concerning motherhood, nurturance, and sexuality of the breast was very evident. So this is going to play a big role in what kind of a program can be effective there. I just want to skip ahead to the journalists. The use of journalists and celebrities was also very advanced and we think would be an excellent part of a communication strategy for research and for implementation. So the next slide shows, oh, this is actually a repeat. Yes. Probably a little out of order. Anyway. Um, and what I've, what I've been saying, they do have the infrastructure for research, teaching hospitals, and tissue collection, uh, perhaps less um, monitored than in some places, but well established because of the trust in the medical system. Go on to the next one. Uh, we wanted to also, you may have seen this, it was, we used, the, we have the, um, one of the leading pop music singers in the country is depicted here. She is also a traditional leader and they have this ideas of queen mothers in one of the ethnic groups in, um, in Ghana. They have tremendous ethnic and linguistic diversity, but media helps to bring together a sense of national identity. And this woman is a leading pop singer. We were, uh, this is at an outreach event where we did, uh, Beatrice Wiafi also pictured here, holds these at churches where maybe a hundred women will come together and have breast cancer screenings and they'll get breast education, they'll be shown pictures, they'll be uh, given lectures, they'll be interacted with and then this woman who's on the board of Breast Care International uh, is this pop singer and traditional leader and she came and produced a new song about breast cancer and it was like why do you want to die of breast cancer you know come to the hospital there's treatment available and so <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful kind of element for us of the power of communication. So let's go on to the last slide. Um, we wanted to talk about, in summary, the cultural aspects of moving breast cancer research uh, prevention forward, both for research and for later communication about what to do is to explore further the attitudes toward the breast and the body, which vary by country and will have important roles in the plans for communication about primary prevention of breast cancer. You may have noticed we slipped in a couple of uh, artistic representations of breasts because we're actually paying attention to the imagery that can carry the message well. The variation in dynamics of food consumption was dramatic among these countries. In, in Ghana, there's a lot of something called fufu. And I forgot to mention hookah smoking in Lebanon on also. There's a lot of young women are smoking hookahs. So we have hookahs, yerba mate, fufu. We have a lot of very unique elements to the dietary patterns and exposures. So variations by uh, social class, age, sex, and whether people are going through this transition to more uh, fast food is, is an element we'll continue with. This dietary transition and globalization will need to be traced. So thank you. Let's go back to Sophie. Thank you very much. So I'm going to summarize then what, uh, go back to the public policy as a summary of what we have learned. As I told you before, the uh, cultural and social economic level is really important in diseases like breast cancer. Stress, nutrition, pollutants, all of these have been shown to have an influence on breast cancer incidence as well as, on, uh, as, as, well as, as on the epigenome. And so, and this is known to lead to health disparities. There's a huge uh, discrepancies among women in terms of breast cancer in our countries but also in uh, countries throughout the world and that could be explained by this environmental factor and how it impacts uh, the epigenome. So what have we learned regarding legal issues for international research and primary prevention? So we, it's very important that we went there so that we could understand who has the power to influence public health policies in those countries so that we can directly talk to um, these people. Also, regarding consent procedures, it's very important that once we start doing the project there in those different countries, this is tailored to a specific country regarding post-donation. And you might not think it's important, but what, is, what kind of information will people receive from their donation? There are countries like in France that it is, where it's mandatory to, to be able to 
to trace back a tissue to a donor so that if we identify something that is wrong with that tissue even 10, 20 years later, and that could be important for the health of this person, we can actually go back and tell her. That would be, of course, the clinician would do this. In the United States, that's not the case. In the, there are countries where there's nothing in the law, but then the clinicians think that they would like to be able to go back to their donors and be able to tell them something important about their uh, disease. So we need to really think about this and also the transfer of donated tissue. Uh, there's absolutely an absolute need, an absolute need, sorry, for an international bio, a biomedical ethics charter to regulate the use, the donation and use of these uh, normal tissues because, again, that's something that's quite novel and uh, Laurence has been working on this charter in the past uh, few weeks now so that we can move forward uh, with this. Um, just for you to see, we have made sure to have connection not only between um, uh, diff with different uh, academic institutions, research institutions, hospitals in the different countries, but also when it was appropriate with governmental uh, agencies that have an impact on public policy. So you have a list right here of the different uh, agencies in, in the different country. And sometimes it was not a good idea to do that yet. So again, we use the, uh, the uh, advice of our partners to the decided who we should actually contact in those countries. The outcomes, um, to finish here, so we have uh, had different outcomes here. First, the training. So it was important for us to involve uh, students. So we have two graduate students. And Laurence went back to school, so she's a professional, but also went back for a PhD in health law uh, with the University of Rennes. And we also have uh, a student coming from Lebanon who arrived actually last week in my laboratory who is going to work on a project on the uh, mechanism of breast cancer onset. And she got a L'Oreal Fellowship, UNESCO Fellowship. They only give 15. Uh, throughout the world this year for this. Uh, and a pre-med med undergraduate student in anthropology and nutrition. We have developed an international breast cancer prevention course. Well, Ellen and I are co-leading this course and we now wanted to take it to the world, so make it distance learning and so on. So again, I'm going to work on this this summer through the DLRC. Uh, this is the, distant, the, uh, the discovery <laughs> learning research uh, center at Purdue University, and as I said, we have mobility between countries that's starting uh, for students. We have made a number of presentations, and we have uh, looked for first a small funding, uh, but then we are also preparing now uh, large uh, grants, like for instance, an international training grant in primary prevention of chronic diseases for, that's due September, that's an NIH for Gartie, where we are going to involve our low and middle income countries, uh, like uh, Ghana, uh, Lebanon uh, is also a part of that group, and, and Uruguay. <clears throat> and then publications are also in the making, this uh, list here. But most importantly, we have seen a snowball effect. Snowball effect. Uh, Ellen told you we have pilot teams that have been made in a, uh, put together in these different countries. This was a main factor for our, for our visit because that was the best possible way to get this started is to visit them. But then they have made connections with other countries. You'll see that on the map, which is quite interesting. We have um, a breast cancer prevention symposium that's now scheduled for 2013 in Lebanon, if everything goes well. Uh, it will happen there. And then we also have a network of media that uh, in the diff throughout these different countries that can actually bring information worldwide um, simultaneously. So this is this, you know, you see these little small uh, circles here that show the connections that each of these partner countries have started to make in different parts of the world. So like not only with Qatar uh, for Lebanon. So we are happy that this is happening. This was the idea that we have satellite that would then make collaborations with those uh, countries in their regions. We have had a two symposia. That's our way to bring together the community of scientists who want to partake in primary prevention research, just serving as an umbrella in that case. And it shows that between the two years, the first, first of all, how widespread we have an, an audience. It's, it's a small symposium. We wanted to keep to be small so that we can have discussions about between 100 and 150 people. <laughs> and we also have a good representation of scientists and, and health um, care practitioner and others interested in, in public health and breast cancer uh, as shown here uh, by the, with the different color scales here. 
So uh, the benefit uh, that GPRI will have on this project definitely to help us build this ethics charter that's so important, develop the literature and tools to translate scientific information for pol policy makers. This, we realize that since primary prevention is not understood by most of the people, including scientists, unfortunately, uh, we have to uh, also make some material available for people who are not scientists. So we are working with a, a group uh, of advocates for cancer research, breast cancer research, um, that's uh, led by Meru Smith, and we are going to develop pamphlets and leaflets on primary prevention and epigenetics. And then we want to promote a policy advisory framework for primary prevention of non-communicable diseases. So I'm ending here. We will have a long list of people to acknowledge. This is the core committee at Purdue University that has really led that project from the beginning. And you see it's very uh, multidisciplinary and also the International Liaison Committee. Thank you very much. projects, not only the interdisciplinary leverage, but the financial leveraging, the intellectual leveraging, and the geographic leveraging, and trying to find the sweet spot <laughs> in, in all three types of leveraging. Thank you very much. We're running a little bit late on time, but we'll take a, a two questions. So what should we not be eating? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's, okay, this is, yeah, we can't tell you, because it depends on your epigenome. That's what, you know, this is something that we have to understand is that each person will respond differently to food on the, in the environment. So that's why there's a need for research. Uh, I can give you an example that people are pushing now for, for uh, breastfeeding. They say that's protective. You breastfeed at least six months, you'll be protected against breast cancer. That's not true for the French woman. This is an epidemiology study that showed this. It's true for the American woman. Now I'm French living in America. Maybe I'm protected. I don't know. <laughs> but you see, so it really depends on the population. That's why we need the research. And, and, and it's, not, it's not that we are going to tell people what to eat or not to eat in the end. We want to be able to take their epigenome and say, this is your epigenome. This is what you should be adding to your diet. Because that, and then we can actually measure that very fast by looking at epigenetic changes. So that's one aspect. We also want to be able to develop drugs that will be uh, given either locally, so we're working with engineers on this inside the breast directly through the ducts, the ducts for instance, or uh, that could be without any toxic effects. I don't know if we have to dream. Yeah. But, and, okay, uh, one last. Yes. Yes, but this, this will have to be the last question, and the rest will have to be answered during the break. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so there's more to do than just nutrition, but this is our tool to identify what's happening in the breast and the level of the genome. I was just curious, on the first chart that you showed that had the map mm -hmm. um, of breast cancer intensity, I guess, um, it, it struck me that the highest density areas are areas that have well-developed health care systems and low-density areas don't. And I guess my question is, is it clear that there's a difference in, is it, in incidence, or is it just being captured and identified more yes. in the areas that have well-developed systems? It's, it's just both. I think that because we have had that uh, very detrimental environment for a long time, we definitely have a higher incidence in our countries, but also it's captured much better. And actually pushing for mammography, some people say it's leading to overdiagnosis. So diagnosis of women would not, would not actually progress with the disease. So that's one thing. And also when you look at those countries, the, the countries under development, when they start looking at incidence of breast cancer, they see more and more when they really start having a program to look for them. When yes, we were, the yes. So by yes. making sense of what could otherwise be a, a misapprehension. Right. And then we are with, with uh, Beatrice Uefade when she does those screening uh, with women who are invited to come from the community, she, she finds about 1% of uh, 1 out of 100 women has a, a tumor. Uh, it so has, a, has a lump. Has a lump but, then, then, but most of the time it is a tumor. So it's showing that it's actually quite high what she's identifying. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, and thank you Ellen. You're